asset packs. Let's talk about asset packs. Hey, so guys, my name is Chana. Welcome back to another Hazel Devlog, traditional style. Today, I'm gonna to be fulfilling one of the promises that I have made a long time ago. Something that you guys have asked for. We're going to talk about asset packs in Hazel. So step one, what is an asset pack? Why do they exist? Why do we need them? And what exactly am I even talking about? Put simply, asset packs are files and they contain all of the assets for a given Hazel project once we decide to ship it or distribute it and run it inside the runtime. Now it's probably easier to show what I'm talking about with an example. So let's take a look at a game that we made in Hazel for Lotum Dare 51, like a couple of years ago, I think. It's called Dichotomy. This is what you're greeted with when you actually download the game. And inside this main folder over here, we have another folder with all of the content in it and an assets directory. And inside the assets directory, here it is, assetpack.hap. It's about a hundred megabytes. This file contains all of the assets for the entire game, except for the sounds which are in this sound bank and there's some metadata stored inside this audio commands registry as well. We just haven't consolidated the two systems together. That's something we'll likely do in the future. In this video, I'm gonna try and give you somewhat of a technical rundown of how this file works, why it exists, what the actual format is, how we access and interface with it through the actual code base within Hazel. And hopefully this will provide a little bit of insight into some of the technical decisions we may have made around this format. So what exactly is it and why do we have this file that contains every single asset inside our project. And furthermore, why does this just apply to the runtime? How does this normally work in the editor? This is where things get a little bit tricky uh, because we need to start talking about how assets in general work in Hazel, which is probably a good video for the future. We're actually refining the system at the moment. I've been live streaming a lot of that work on Twitch. Asset packs are unique in the sense that they're something that we actually distribute. So there's a few different decisions that need to be made for a format like that versus something Thing inside the editor. To keep things short, the biggest difference is the fact that when you have a file such as a 3D model or a texture and you wanna ship that and you want that to be included as part of your runtime, the name of the game is optimization and specifically optimization for that use case. The use case of, I want people to be able to play my game and obviously load those assets and use those assets, you know, in the, in the game. You also probably don't want people to be able to just take those assets and use them for other things. What I mean by that is you probably don't want people just stealing your 3D models out of your game because they're just GLTF files or FPX files. They can just use them for their own projects. You probably don't want that. So what happens in Hazel is when you are in the editor and you're just making your game. The textures that you use are basically stored on disk in, the, in their source format. So whether that be like a JPEG or a PNG file, that is what the asset looks like on disk. Same with a 3D model. It'll be like a GLTF or an FBX file. That's the source asset that you're working from. That makes sense because you're probably updating it. You're probably working on it inside Blender, exporting it, you know, making your textures in Photoshop or Substance, wh whatever it might be, you are actively working with the source assets in third-party applications. So it makes sense to just retain those because those are like the master files. The problem with those file formats is that they're something that we call intermediate formats. They're meant for sharing between tools and to act as like kind of a, a global in production, in development way to store file data. It basically means that they're not gonna be optimal for loading inside a game. It is not optimal for that use case. So the biggest reason why this concept of asset packs exists is because we want to take all of those source files, all those source assets, JPEGs, PNGs, GLTFs, FBXs, all of that stuff, and convert them into Hazel's native runtime format. So this is basically a file format that exists per asset, which is a representation of the optimal way that we want to store that asset type. So a 3D model, for example, what do we want to do with a 3D model? That could be a video of its own. Let me know if you want to see that in the comments below. But basically all the different things that make up that mesh. So the actual vertex data, for example, and the material data and the node hierarchy and the skeleton, if it's, if it's animated, like all of that stuff needs to be taken and put into a format, which means we have to like manipulate the memory and, and run it through a transformation basically to get it into the exact, like for example, vertex buffer that we want to upload into our GPU and it's ready for rendering. That obviously takes time. So instead what we do is we just do that step, but we do it 
when we publish the game. So we do it when we make an asset pack. And so the mesh asset that is stored within that asset pack is exactly that memory representation basically, but on disk. So now we don't have to worry about, let's gather each triangle and build up a vertex buffer or a node hierarchy or whatever it may be. We just simply read the bytes from disk and just put them directly into our VRAM on our GPU and it's ready to go. That is obviously much, much, much faster than if we had to read like a GLTF file and then build up each triangle one by one, put that into like a vector and then put that into the vertex buffer and do all of that transformation every time we load that file. So inside the asset pack, we have those runtime Hazel format assets basically. And then we just have like an index and some kind of way to just organize them so that if we want a specific asset, we can obviously reach for it. And all of those assets are stored inside that one asset pack. So it's not like we have, you know, one file per asset on disk. It's just all basically combined into that one asset pack file. Now, before we jump in and take a look at some actual code here today, if you're just beginning your programming journey and finding it a little bit difficult, then I highly recommend you check out Brilliant.org, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. Computer science and math go together really well and Brilliant has a lot of content for both of those. So specifically their programming content. They've actually been working on it and expanding it. So they have lots of new courses for you to try out. If you're a beginner, these computer science courses will visually teach you how you can think like a programmer and they'll do that in an engaging and an interactive way. They've expanded recently into actual Python. So they'll teach you how to make programs in Python. And the real benefit here is that they'll do that in their brilliant way. So like over here in their calculus course, you can see that they're presenting all of this to you visually. They're giving you these widgets that you can drag around and play with to see how the numbers actually work. And of course, they'll quiz you. They'll make sure you're paying attention and actually learning and retaining this information. But you don't have to take my word for it. Brilliant have a 30 day free trial that you can use to try out literally everything on their platform. Just go to brilliant.org slash the channel. Link will be in the description below. And that link will also get you 20% off an annual member if you go on to like it. Huge thank you as always to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. What I want to do now is just jump right into taking a look at this asset pack format. It's just a binary file. We can go ahead and take a look at it. My favorite tool for doing that is a tool called HXD. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. It's just a really good binary viewer. So if we grab this asset pack file, we can drag it into this program. And you can see we're presented with all of these bytes here in hexadecimal format. You can change the alignment like to whatever you want. And it also decodes the text for you here. It's also really fast. You can scroll through this file and it will actually load the portions you're viewing live. So it's not gonna just load the whole file into memory all at once, which is really good for large files. And it also won't consume all of your RAM. Anyway, you can see that it's just a whole bunch of binary data. That's the file. So how does the file format work? Let's take a look at it. I've created this diagram for you. So this is our asset pack.hap file. The first, I guess 16 bytes here are something called a header. So we have HZAP, literally those letters. If we go back to HXD for a second, you can see HZAP, that text is literally there. It's these four bytes. That is there simply so that we just know what the file format is. It's just a really easy way to validate. Does someone have a valid file? Obviously it doesn't guarantee validity for the entire file, but it's a good start to just be like, is this a Hazel asset pack? The next thing we have is a version, which is the version of the actual format. So this is important because if we ever decide to change any of this layout, it's not necessarily gonna work with binary serialization and deserialization. So we need to make sure that we are aware of what version this particular file is, because that way, if we do change something in the future, we can be like, ah, oh, this is version three. So therefore use this layout to decode that file as an example. Build version. So this is eight bytes. What this is, is something I came up with, I think later in the format. So this didn't exist immediately. This build version refers to when that asset pack was actually built. So when you're working on your game or your project inside the Hazel editor, and you decide to build one of these asset packs, this is supposed to be here as a way to know which kind of version of that asset pack you built. Now, the reason why is because as we update a game or update a, a project or whatever it may be, and we, you know, we'll, we'll work on it a bit and then we'll want to build an additional asset pack, we typically don't have to rebuild the entire game binary because the asset pack contains like the game's content in a way. And so if we change that game's content, 
we can just update just the asset pack file. But to do that, it's obviously important to know what version we're dealing with. So this version refers to the version of the actual asset pack file format, whereas this is like the build version of these assets. Now to make this super simple, we store this as basically a date time. So what this number is, it's an eight byte integer here. What it is, is it's the year. So for example, 2024, then it'll be the month 03, then it'll be the date, which today is the 25th, and then it'll be the time. So it's 1252. So this number over here, this 64 bit unsigned integer, that acts as the build version. And the editor, when it builds one of these asset packs, simply grabs the current date time, puts it into this format, and then writes it into this asset pack header. Inside any Hazel shipped game, you can actually hit control F3, I think it is, to bring up some diagnostic kind of debug information. And that number will be visible there in the game. So that way you can see kind of what version you're dealing with. And you can imagine that during development, during shipping, that's very, very useful. And that's better than just manually incrementing the version to one, two, three, four, because that's essentially meaningless. But this way you can see exactly when that was built and that just helps a lot. Okay, so next up we have the index. So that's kind of the, the entire header. Then we have the index. And the index is basically the index of the rest of the content inside the asset pack. So what do we have inside the asset pack? Assets. So this index is supposed to be your index to what you have inside that asset pack because you're probably gonna to wanna to read the assets at some point. Now the first 16 bytes here, they contain the app binary offset and app binary size. So what that is, is not exactly a traditional asset, but rather the actual c -sharp DLL, which contains all of your scripts. So all of your game scripts that you wrote in c -sharp, they get compiled into a c -sharp DLL, and that c -sharp DLL gets embedded into this asset pack file. And this is the offset within this asset pack file. So what byte offset contains that C sharp script. So where does it start? So that I can like see the binary data and obviously the size of it so that I know how much of it. So what we can then do is if we need that C sharp DLL basically because we wanna execute our game script, so we can just jump to this offset, read that size and then send that into the script engine and it now knows what script code to run. So that's what that is. So that's stored kind of explicitly and separately, I guess, inside the index. We then have a scene map which is a variable length because it depends how many scenes we have, obviously. So if we're going through like this file format here and we're reading it from top to bottom like this, the entire scene map would kind of be embedded within here. So it's not stored at an offset, but I've just drawn this arrow to show what an actual scene map is because it's a little bit more complicated uh, to just write it out here. And so the scene map, what that is, is a map. It's a map of asset handle to this struct called scene info. So an asset handle is something we use in Hazel. It's basically an asset ID. It's like a universally unique identifier that will identify any asset that Hazel has. Uh, it's basically randomly generated whenever you create an asset and that identifier should be globally unique and will live on throughout the lifetime of your project unless you manually like regenerate it. Scenes are also considered assets. So they have asset handles which identify scenes. Note that there's no file paths here. Right, so first of all, it's all within that one asset pack file. We know that much, but there's also no, like we don't know what the file path representing that scene is. The way that we're supposed to address it is by the asset handle, which means that if I want to load a scene in my game, what do I do? Well, I can just look at the index and I can be like, all right, well, find me the scene with a particular asset handle with a particular ID. And then I can, I can request that basically and progress on with that. So that's how that works. So what does the scene info have then? So every single asset handle Handle, it's a map will contain a scene info as the value. This is like the key and this is the value. So the scene info has packed offset and packed size. Again, much like the app binary offset and size, this is just an indication as to where inside the rest of the file does my scene data live because I need to read the scene. The scene itself is an asset. So therefore it's gonna contain some sort of data such as like oh, what are all of the entities in the scene and you know etc so where is that stored so this offset and this size just links all the way down here into the binary blob which i've listed here which is where uh the binary data exists so same with this probably should have mentioned this app binary offset and app binary size this is an offset into this binary blob somewhere and the size just lets us you know select like a, a bunch of bytes so that we know how much how, how big that data is. Same with this, right? So a, every scene will have an offset, like it'll be located somewhere, the, the data will be located somewhere within this binary blob, which is just later on in the format. Um, and then the size obviously determines 
how many bytes to read there. So flags is a short here, two bytes, just a two byte integer, which just lets us store any flags that we might want to, such as like what kind of scene is it? What is it compressed out or is it not? It's really just up to the packaging system to store any flags as to how it's packaged, for example, if it wants. Uh, and then we have an asset map. So much like we have a scene map here, we have an asset map, which basically is a map of asset handle to actual asset info, which tells us all of the assets that are located within this scene. So you can see immediately how we index things by scene. We don't, like this kind of index over here does not have a list of assets. Instead, it has a list of scenes and within each scene, we have a list of the assets there. Now, assets can be shared across scenes. And in that case, this index will be duplicated. The actual asset data will not, so if you have like a sphere mesh and that is inside each one of the five scenes you have in your game, then that sphere mesh data will not be duplicated. But inside every one of those scenes and inside their scene info, you will have an asset map and that asset handle of your sphere will appear five times. That's generally okay, it's not a big deal because you can see that the asset map, like it doesn't store that much data, it just has some information. So for that given asset ID, where is it located again and how big is it within this binary blob? And then what is the asset type? So is it a mesh, is it a texture? And then any flags associated with it, which might be something like, is it is the data compressed? Is it, do I have to do something to it to get the data? Whatever that might be. So that is basically the entire format. And what you see over here, this kind of part over here, this is loaded immediately into RAM, into memory, when you load an asset pack. This is not. So this is never fully loaded and it's only partially loaded when you actually need to load an asset. So the idea is this index, we, we do in fact store all the time just so that we know everything about where assets are within that binary blob, but we don't load them. So if we take a look at an example of how loading might happen, um, like suppose that I need to load that sphere mesh that I mentioned earlier, and I'm in, I'm in a given scene obviously, and I just need to load that sphere mesh. So what I do is I come into the index, I jump to the correct scene, because I know that I'm in a given scene. And then within that scene, I'm gonna look at the asset map for that asset handle of that sphere mesh that I wanna load. And then I'll look over here and I'll see that, okay, it's located at an offset and this is the size of it. So now I'm gonna jump over here into the binary blob. Let's just say it's located over here and it's like all of these bytes or whatever. So I'll open the file for reading at this offset. I'll read X amount of bytes into a buffer. I'll close the file and then I'll pass that buffer on to Hazel's like runtime importer, runtime asset loader, so that it can process the data as it sees fit. Uh, and that's basically it. So it happens on basically a per asset basis like that. Now, what happens if you're looking <laughs> for an asset, but you don't know what scene it belongs to? This is not a common use case, I would say, because usually assets exist within a scene context. But if for, I don't know, whatever reason you are doing that, there are functions available to do that. However, they will, that's not like the fast optimized path because what will happen is you'll basically search every scene for that asset. So we can iterate through all of the scenes inside our scene map, say we have five, and for each of those scenes, as we iterate through them, we'll just check their asset map for the handle that you've requested. That's like the fallback slower path. Uh, but otherwise you can see every asset is stored contextually inside its scene. Now, as I mentioned with the sphere mesh being duplicated potentially, all that means is that again, if you have five scenes and each one of them have a sphere mesh, you will have that sphere mesh's asset handle be an entry in every asset map in every scene. So you'll basically have five, I guess, asset handle and asset info somewhere within your index, but then obviously the packed offset and packed size will be the same. So they'll always refer basically to this section inside the binary blob because there's clearly no need for us to duplicate that data when we store it. But the reason why it's like that is just easier for us from a technical and just organizational point of view to have assets grouped by the scene that you're in because usually that's the common use case. You'll be inside a scene and you want the assets within just that scene. The other benefit is that it just makes asset kind of managing, I guess, a little bit easier in terms of asset unloading. So if we have all the assets in a scene, we know that once that scene gets dropped, we can just unload all those assets and we don't really need to look at that scene per se. Of course, 
can be assets, like that sphere that is shared across scenes, meaning that it's it's one asset, but it's used in like every scene or in multiple scenes. But in a lot of cases, we have lots of assets that obviously just exist within a particular scene. And this makes it a little bit easier to deal with those. Now, jumping into some code, finally, I don't want to spend too much time here. I think that it is probably more useful to look at that diagram I drew earlier, but just to give you an example of how this works, and I might save the more technical details of how I like to serialize binary and all of that stuff for a future video. Let me know if you want to see that in the comments below. This is what the format actually looks like as C++ code. This is how I like to do my formats. Here's the file header with the four bytes being here. We have a version of the asset pack and we have a build version in that example format that I mentioned. That's just a struct. It's all inline. There's no memory in direction here. It's all just stored in this memory blob within this struct. Then we have this index table again with the packed binary offsets. And then we have just a normal STD map. Why a map? Why not an unordered map? Because a map is sorted and we want to sort this by its asset handle. This just makes debugging and organization and even things like a version control a lot easier. You probably wouldn't be version controlling, you know, this binary file, but ordered maps, if you don't specifically need a performance boost that you know exists with an unordered map with a hash map, which of course can happen depending on the size of the map and other things, then I strongly prefer to use these ordered sorted maps. And since this is a file, so basically when we access this map, it's because we specifically want to load an asset. The process of loading an asset in terms of performance, the bulk is going to be the actual loading like from the file and from, the, from disk, you know, that that's where the time is spent. So a little map lookup is not necessarily going to be the bottleneck or a part that we should optimize for. So that's just a little bit of insight as to why I've chosen this because that comes up every now and then on my live streams. People ask me, why do I use map versus unordered map? Uh, you know, where do I use which? So hopefully that helps clarify that a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, you can see we got our scene info, which is up here. We've got our asset info, which is up here. That's it. That's how I like to express this in C++. It's just a struct called asset pack file, which has all of these like structs inside it uh, and all the concepts that I need. So obviously maps uh, are not really, STD map is not really something you can just serialize and deserialize from disk directly. Uh, so we do have special functions that process that and actually serialize it in a format that we would like to serialize it in. And so if we look at some of the files here, so asset pack, is a file that represents the API for dealing with these things. So you can see that it has the ability to uh, actually serialize an asset pack. So typically the way you do that is you just do create from active project. And there's this just a little float here that's atomic for progress because it's usually done on a separate thread. Um, ignore that, that's just so that we know like where in the process of serializing or creating an asset pack we are so we can display a progress bar. But basically this function is what lets us actually create one of these asset packs, which you can see has that that file and all the stuff inside it. And then we have load, which lets us load an asset pack from a file path. So if we look at how that works, it just uses this asset pack serializer to just read the index. So if we get into this, now we're getting into some actual serialization code. So you can see, for example, here is us using Hazel serialization API to open up a file stream reader. Uh, we can make sure it's good and then we can immediately read that header and then just do like a mem compare to make sure that it is HZAP. That's what I was talking about earlier. And if it's not, we can just um, just basically return false saying that we couldn't read the file. Uh, and then we progress and we just basically read everything we need to read to get that entire index that we looked at in asset pack file, you know, into memory. So now we have all of this data that we can deal with. And once we have that, what happens when we want to load an asset? Well, we specify what scene it's in and what asset handle, uh, you know, that asset that we want to load is. If we don't specify a scene handle, you can see there's a slower path, which is what I mentioned where we have to search. But otherwise, the faster path over here is if we have specified a scene handle and an asset handle, it'll simply go through, make sure that obviously we actually have a scene with that handle and that asset is basically valid. And if it finds that asset, we now have an asset info. And what can we do with the asset info? Remember the asset info contains that packed offset and packed size. We can just pass that directly into asset importer deserialized from asset pack, which depending on the, the type, so this will go through and find the correct serializer based on the asset type. And then if we look at something like, um, cause there's obviously a lot of asset types. So this will go into a lot of different places, but if we go into like, I think runtime mesh serializer. So we should have a function here called deserialize from asset pack. And you can see that's what it accepts the stream and the asset info. And then what we'll do here is we'll simply set the stream position to that packed offset that I was talking about. Uh, and then, 
similarly to how I showed you that asset pack file format and that structs, we have the same thing obviously for each internal format. So for meshes as an example, and then we'll just jump into here, read it again, the magic code, I guess for this is HZMS, that's Hazel, Hazel mesh basically. Uh, and then we'll just go through and read everything we need to read. So like all of the materials, all, you know, the skeleton and whatever else, vert vertices, indices, bones, whatever it might be inside that format, which again will differ based on the asset. We'll just read simply like that. And the point of this function at the end of the day is to give us a ref asset. In this case, it's a ref static mesh, I guess, or a mesh source or something. I don't know. I think it's a mesh source. And then we have an asset that we can make sure that it's actually got its handle set properly and just return it. And that's that's the process of loading an asset from an asset pack. Now I'm sure lots of you who are more interested in this probably have a lot of follow-up questions. Leave them in the comments below. I can make some more videos. One thing that might be helpful is to take you guys through how I do binary serialization, deserialization in general. Um, cause I know that's like a, that's something I feel like I've developed over time as well, because it can be a little bit confusing and uh, error prone and you kind of want to do it in a clean way, but I don't like doing it automatically. Meaning I don't like to just use some kind of meta programming in C++ to create a reflection library and then try and do everything automatically, auto magically. I think I've had bad experiences with that back when I worked at EA and, um, you know, just people basically five engineers around a desk debugging for like half the day because something won't compile or something went wrong. And it's just, it's a bit of a nightmare. So we do things semi manually inside Hazel. Uh, and if you're interested to see that, let me know in the comments below. I hope this gave you guys some good insight as to how the asset pack format works in Hazel. So far we've shipped two games using asset packs. So these two saving Captain Chino and Dichotomy, both of these games are shipped using asset packs. The games before that, they're actually shipped with the source assets because we didn't have asset packs at that point in time. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to check out Brilliant Dog channel and I will see you next time. Goodbye.